Guayacla. He wasn't a chief, but yet a shaman who held a lifelong belief in his supernatural power. He was born during a rare time of peace between the Apaches and the Mexicans, but that peace slowly disintegrated after Mexico won its independence from Spain in 1821. Geronimo achieved mythical status among Native Americans, as well as among the Mexican and American troops in which he evaded for many years. He didn't fear death. He became famous for his daring exploits. Some white settlers called him the worst Indian that ever lived. His band of Apaches was the last major force of independent Native American warriors who refused to accept the U.S. occupation of the American West. We decided to pack up and head to the Southwest to visit some of the historical sites from Geronimo's life story. So come along with us and we'll show you what many of these legendary places look like today. Apache is the collective term for several historically related groups of Native Americans residing in what is known today as the Southwest United States. These nomadic groups include Western Apache, Chiricahua, Mescalero, Jicarilla, Lipan, Plains, and several others. Historically, the Apache homelands have consisted of high mountains, sheltered valleys, and deep canyons flowing with water. For over 300 years, the Apaches, Mexicans, and Spanish engaged in battle for various reasons. These conflicts were referred to as the Apache-Mexico Wars. Over 18 presidios were established at Llanos and Chihuahua in the 1600s in modern Sonora to help counter early Apache raids. The Apache raids on Mexican villages were so numerous and intense that no area was safe. The raids were embedded in their way of life and were used for strategic and economic purposes. From 1820 to 1835, over 5,000 Mexicans died in Apache raids. By the end of that time period, Mexico did place bounties on Apache scalps. The first recorded history of encounters with the Apaches was from conquistadors of the Spanish crown in the 1620s along the Chama region and San Juan River. The Spanish explorer Coronado reported that in 1540, the modern Western Apache area was uninhabited, but some scholars believe that he simply didn't see the Indians that were present. The fame of the tribe's tenacity and fighting skills were world renowned. The ultimate origin of the name Apache is uncertain and lost to history. I'm sitting on the edge of the Gila River, not far from its confluence with Turkey Creek. It's thought that here, on June 16th, 1829, was where Guayacla, or the one who yawns, was born. His grandfather, Mako, was a chief of the Badonkahe Band of Chiricahua Apaches, which lived along the Gila River through the Black Range in modern-day New Mexico, not too far from where the Gila Cliff Dwellings are located. Now, despite the dwellings being here, it isn't theorized that the Apaches utilized the cliffside shelters. You can see some of the cliff dwellings behind me. Now, it's thought that they were abandoned before the Apache arrived here. In 1846, Guayacla was 17 years old and was admitted to the Council of Warriors. He was now allowed to marry, and he did so just a year later, marrying his lifelong friend, Alope. They would end up having three children together. He appeared to be a superb leader in raiding and warfare, usually leading roughly 30 to 50 Apache warriors, but he wasn't widely liked among other Apaches. He had a bad temper. He was known to be paranoid, but he also seemed to have exquisite luck. He was very much in tune with his spiritual side. One night on the summit of Bowie Mountain, which is right there behind me, he heard Usun's voice in the wind say, you will never die in battle or by gun, and I will guide your arrows. His band carried out raids all over the North Mexican states of Chihuahua and Sonora, and also on this side of the border in regions we know today as Arizona and New Mexico. 
Over the years, the Mexicans and Apaches retaliated against each other. In 1848, after the Mexican-American War ended, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo resulted in Mexico ceding 55% of its territory, which included present-day California, Nevada, New Mexico, most of Arizona, Colorado, and a few other states. At this point, the Apaches had two enemies, the Mexicans to the south and the United States all around them. On March 5, 1858, Goyacla traveled with his wife and sons to Llanos, Chihuahua to trade for supplies. The Apaches would normally make camp outside of the village they were visiting, and majority of the men would head into the village to make trades. A small crew would be left behind to guard the women and children. While in town, a force of over 400 Mexican soldiers, led by Colonel Jose Carrasco, attacked the small Apache camp and killed Geronimo's wife, mother, and children. Geronimo would eventually return home and marry several more times, but ultimately, he never would recover from the tragedy in Chihuahua. As for his other wives he would marry in the coming years, all of them were either killed or sold into slavery, never to be seen again. In the late 1850s, Chief Mangus Coloradus, also known as Red Sleeves, sent Guayacla to join up with Chief Cochise to fight the Mexicans. Now, where the name Geronimo came from has always been a hot topic of discussion. During a battle with Mexican soldiers, Guayacla heard soldiers calling him Geronimo. Geronimo is the Spanish version of Jerome, so one potential explanation is that the Mexican soldiers were shouting prayers to St. Jerome in the heat of battle. Regardless of the meaning or what was actually said, Guayacla essentially adopted the name and started using it. Now, after the massacre of some of his family and fellow warriors in Chihuahua years earlier, Geronimo developed a really deep hatred for Mexicans and never seemed to waver. Talking about one of his raids on the state of Sonora, he said, I cannot call back my loved ones, but I can rejoice in revenge. In February of 1861, U.S. Lieutenant George Bascom asked Cochise to meet with him concerning a kidnapping that had taken place. Cochise decided to meet, and during the discussions he stated that he wasn't responsible, but that he could find out who was responsible within 10 days if he was given the chance. The person in question had actually become a scout for another Indian tribe and would later be known as the legendary U.S. Army Apache scout Mickey Free. It also appeared that Cochise was going to be imprisoned due to an ultimatum from Bascom. He decided to escape Bascom's clutches once he understood the meanings of the words being used by Bascom. He escaped and was wounded, however, he left some of his family behind in the process. Bascom told his men to pack up camp as he knew raids were imminent. Apache signal fires were on the horizon as they were gathering and preparing for attack. Mangus Coloradus brought warriors, Geronimo brought 20 more warriors, and the White Mountain Apache brought even more. Everyone went back to Apache Pass and took positions around the mountain and the station. Cochise wanted his family back and demanded a meeting to which Bascom agreed to. Cochise took three warriors to meet the lieutenant and talk. Suddenly, other Apache warriors flanked the group having discussions and grabbed a hostage. Bascom's soldiers opened fire and Cochise and his men ran to a nearby ravine for cover with the hostage. Cochise showed up the next day with the hostage in hopes that Bascom would trade for his family. Cochise then decided to come up with a plan to rescue the prisoners since Bascom and his men were sitting right square in the middle of Apacheria. The Apaches made a move but were spotted by soldiers near Apache Spring and repelled them with heavy gunfire. They retreated. Lieutenant Isaiah Moore took over the station and ended up hanging some of the captives, including Cochise's brother. His wife and son were released. Ultimately though, the Bascom affair is what would trigger the war with the U.S. government. On July 15, 1862, over 2,500 men of the California Column, which were Union volunteers led by Colonel James Carleton, were on their way to fight the Confederacy when they ran into 500 Apache warriors led by Cochise and Mangus Coloradus at what is known today as Apache Pass. Possessing the high ground and ample supplies, including fresh spring water from Apache Spring, the Apaches attacked, focusing on the two howitzer cannons first. It was always thought that Geronimo actually did fight in the Battle of Apache Pass, but it was never confirmed. 
the soldiers secured Apache Spring, and Mangus Coloradus was shot during a charge. The soldiers fought off wave after wave of Apache guerrillas with their cannons, and eventually forced the Apaches to retreat. Mangus Coloradus was eventually captured and taken to Fort McLean. He was stabbed with bayonets and shot three times. Just a little way south of Silver City, along this ravine here is where they buried his body. Now, a few weeks after his death, they did dig up his body and they mutilated it. And then what was left was reburied. This infuriated Cochise and he stepped up the frequency and the veracity of his raids. On October 12th, 1872, Cochise agreed to meet with General Oliver Howard to talk peace and try to achieve peace at any cost. Eventually, both sides agreed that Cochise would stay on his own land in the Chiricahuas and stop the raiding parties. For two years, there actually was peace. On June 8, 1874, Chief Cochise passed away peacefully and was buried in an unmarked grave near the Cochise stronghold. Geronimo would later marry one of Cochise's daughters and, out of respect for his late father-in-law, he would keep the peace. In 1876, Indian agent John Clum decided that all Apaches should be moved to the San Carlos Apache Reservation so they could be managed better and that prospectors could invade their land and look for gold. Plans were set in motion for this to take place. This infuriated Geronimo and set off a new round of fighting. The U.S. had once again failed to keep their word. Geronimo's band would prove to be ruthless and quite elusive. Stories were abound that stated he had the ability to heal the sick and the wounded that he could slow down time, uh, avoid bullets, bring rainstorms, and even see into the future. In 1877, Geronimo was captured and returned to the San Carlos Reservation in chains. After finally being released, he gave farming and reservation life a try, at least for the next four years. Once again, Geronimo broke out of the San Carlos Reservation with his family and more warriors, and went south to the rugged and austere Sierra Madre range. Operating from here would enable him to raid both sides of the border. During these raids, nobody was spared. Isolated ranches, wagon trains, prospectors, and random travelers were all violently robbed, brutally tortured, and most were killed or left for dead. After a couple of years of brutal raids, the government was placing pressure on the U.S. military to stop him and his band. In 1883, Mexico decided to allow the U.S. to send troops into Mexico to pursue Geronimo's band and other renegade Apache bands. This led to Geronimo's Apache band negotiating peace with the U.S. and Geronimo agreed to come back to the reservation as he was growing sick and tired of being on the run. However, two years later, the 55-year-old Geronimo made yet another escape based on the fact that he heard from soldiers that they were going to kill him. Geronimo stated that on several occasions of his captive life, his supernatural sources would force him to leave the reservation before troops seized him or just prior to the moment his life and liberty seemed to be threatened. While leaving the reservation this time, his band killed a settler and his family. It is believed that his Apaches killed hundreds of people, including soldiers and settlers on both sides of the border. In 1885, a $25,000 bounty was placed on Geronimo's head. In March of 1887, General George Crook forced Geronimo to surrender, but he would once again escape under the cover of night with 40 other warriors. Out of disgust, General Crook resigned. General Nelson Miles would replace General Crook. He initially decided to stop using the Apache scouts and decided to place over 5,000 soldiers in the desert to find Geronimo, but he failed to do so. General Miles selected Captain Henry Lawton to command B Troop 4th Cavalry from Fort Huachuca and made the decision to reinstate the Apache scouts, but he placed them under the control of Lieutenant Charles Gatewood. Gatewood would be put in position to lead the expedition to bring Geronimo and his followers back to the reservation system for the last time. Geronimo and Gatewood both knew each other and they respected one another. Now, Captain Lawton was instructed to pursue, subdue, and return Geronimo dead or alive to the U.S. He was tenacious in wearing the Apaches down and allowed them no time to rest or sit in one place. Finally, on August 26, 1886, Gatewood scouts located Geronimo's camp and Gatewood persuaded Geronimo to meet with General Miles.
completely worn out, the small band of Geronimo's Apaches officially surrendered for the fourth and final time to General Miles, right here in Skeleton Canyon on September 4th, 1886. Now, this canyon was originally known as Guadalupe Canyon, but it was nicknamed Skeleton Canyon as a result of the bones of cows and humans left behind from cattle drives to Mexico. Geronimo credited Gatewood for his decision to surrender as he spoke some Apache and respected their traditions and values. Geronimo stated that he and his warriors wanted to go back to the reservation to be with their families, but General Miles told him that everyone had moved to Fort Marion in Florida. He was told he could give up and join his family in Florida and then return to Arizona in two years or that he would be chased for the next 50 years or whenever he could be killed. Those in positions of power in DC thought hard about his fate. Ultimately, he was allowed to live. They stacked up stones and made a promise that there would be peace until the stones turned to dust. When he was taken prisoner, he possessed a Winchester 1876 lever action rifle that is now on display at West Point. He also had a Colt single action army revolver and a Sheffield Bowie knife made by George Wastenholm. Now, Fort Sill is in possession of Geronimo's revolver and knife, but at the time of this filming, those items aren't on display. In the end, Geronimo kept his word, but General Miles did not. All Apaches, even if they helped his scouts, were all destined to be shipped east out of Arizona and become prisoners. Geronimo was brought here to Fort Bowie, where he drank from Apache Spring one last time. Now, little did he know that he would never return home. He took his last steps on his native land and entered a train car for the first time in his life. They were sent to Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio and then transferred to Fort Pickens in Pensacola, Florida a few weeks later, still separated from their families. The Florida humidity and diseases carried by mosquitoes took a major toll on the Apaches. The children were ripped away from their families and sent to the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania. Here, the children were forbidden to speak their native tongue, their hair was cut, and they were taught the way of the white man. This was nothing less than a purging of Apache customs and culture. Over 18 Apaches died in the first eight months of being in Florida. The inhabitants of Fort Marion, where the families were sent, stated that they felt terrible for the Apache prisoners. They would give them clothes, bake bread for them, and they stated they felt the Apaches were quite friendly. On October 25, 1886, Geronimo and 15 warriors were sent to the Max Prison in Pensacola named Fort Pickens. They were locked up behind bars here and were assigned hard labor. This would continue until May of 1887 when the Apaches from Fort Marion and Fort Pickens were transferred out of Florida to Mount Vernon in Alabama where they would finally be reunited with their families. Life here was somewhat better as Lieutenant Walter Reed allowed the Apaches to hunt as long as they returned before dark. Sadly, a quarter of the Apache population ultimately succumbed to tuberculosis and malaria. In 1894, all of the remaining prisoners, which now only total 300, were transferred to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Although he remained a prisoner, he had a home and farm just north of the Medicine Bluffs area. He did spend a couple of nights in this jailhouse, but it was for intoxication. It's impossible to line up this shot right here because this tree is in the way. But this is the angle that the picture was taken at right here. At least with Fort Sill, this was more familiar terrain. The granite rocks of the Wichita Mountains resembled the towering, rugged Dragoon Mountains. The spring-fed Medicine Creek resembled the Gila River. They could hear coyotes howl again. Geronimo was allowed to live with his family. Villages were constructed around the post, and the Apaches were given plots of land for farming. It's also rumored that he tried to escape by running and jumping from the top of Medicine Bluffs, which is right there behind me. The legend continues that in the midst of his jump, he yelled, Geronimo! Now, the drop is over 300 feet, and while it is quite steep, it's not completely vertical. It would be very hard to believe he did this without causing serious injury to himself. So this picture here was taken right down there near where that dam is now that you see. It's hard to line this one up because when you shoot back this direction, there's just so much vegetation. 
so many trees that have grown up. But this right here is the cliff that you see the horses and the men standing on. So they were standing right here. But if I go down there and take that picture, you're not gonna be able to see the actual bluffs themselves will be covered up by the trees. Now, he was allowed to ride his horse into Lawton where he would make money by selling buttons and other regalia that he and others made. For the rest of his life, Geronimo would be in demand as an attraction for events around the country. In 1904, he traveled to St. Louis to appear at the World's Fair. On September 4th, 1905, he was part of Teddy Roosevelt's inaugural parade. Geronimo rode horseback down Pennsylvania Avenue with five Indian chiefs wearing full headgear and war paint. While in D.C., he was granted an audience with the president where he begged and pleaded for him and his fellow Apaches to be granted release from prisoner status and be given the ability to go back to their homeland in the Southwest. President Roosevelt refused on the grounds that he had killed way too many people to be granted full freedom ever again. Via interpreter, he stated, You have a bad heart. You killed many people. You burned villages. You were not good Indians. Despite never traveling without guards, he was able to put money in his pockets. And also, despite so many wrongdoings towards his people from the white man, he ultimately stated that he forgave all whites. I made peace with the white man, but I will kill Mexicans wherever I can. He attempted to learn Christianity in his elder years, trying to understand the principles of forgiveness as he felt guilt for all of his years of killing. One artist that visited Geronimo had stated the leader had over 50 bullet holes in his body. In 1909, Geronimo made one of his many trips into Lawton. After a night of heavy drinking, he fell off of his horse and laid in the cold pouring rain all night long. They found him not too far from this area, here near the modern day junction of Rogers Lane and I-44. He was immediately taken to the hospital where he developed pneumonia. On February 17, 1909, at the age of 79, the legendary Apache leader Geronimo was pronounced dead. Now the building is long gone, but right here is where the hospital used to stand that Geronimo passed away in. He always regretted surrender, and on his deathbed, he told his nephew that he should have fought until he was the last man alive. He was buried along Beef Creek Apache Cemetery on Fort Sill. In 1914, after 27 years of imprisonment, the government finally freed the Chiricahua Apaches and allowed them to go home. One third of them stayed at Fort Sill, and the other two thirds moved to the Mescalero Apache Reservation in New Mexico. In 1943, a journalist was visiting Geronimo's grave and ran into an old Apache man that stated a group of Chiricahua patriots removed Geronimo's remains and took him home to the Chiricahuas, burying him in an unmarked grave. In 1986, former San Carlos Apache chairman Ned Anderson received an anonymous letter with a photograph and a book claiming the Skull and Bones was in possession of Geronimo's skull. Six members of Yale's Skull and Bones Secret Society served as Army volunteers at Fort Sill during World War I, including Prescott Bush. We may never know if this is true or just a myth, as at that time, his grave was unmarked. In 1928, the Army covered Geronimo's grave with concrete and provided the stone monument that exists today. At the time of Cochise and Mangus Coloradus, the Chiricahua was told roughly 1,200. At the end of the war in 1886, they numbered 500. By release from POW status, they only numbered around 261. Today, there are at least 850 Chiricahua Apache, and the descendants of Geronimo live on.